Good morning and good evening to everybody. Uh, we are very happy that we are now having the inaugural lecture for the 8th South South Forum on Sustainability. So this year, uh, we have changed the format a little bit. Uh, we are going to have um, well, dialogues and lectures and workshops. And uh, starting from today, we will be extending all the way until July the 19th. So every, uh, every day at this time, or roughly around this time, uh, we will be having a session. So it could be very early in the um, uh, West uh, in, in the Americas, it could be sometimes at six o'clock or seven o'clock in the morning in the Americas, uh, but then it could be uh, past midnight uh, for us, for some of us in Asia. But then, um, well, this is uh, one way in which we try to find um, uh, an opportunity and a space to talk to each other. And uh, this actually was not quite possible before the pandemic. Uh, before the pandemic, we had been used to a way of um, talking to each other uh, by physically meeting with each other. And of course, there's always the pleasure and the joy of embracing and hugging each other, uh, well, having meals, taking walks. But then uh, since the pandemic, then this has not been possible. And yet we have also uh, tried to make the best of it. And, and so uh, last year in our seventh um, South South Forum, we already started the mode of uh, well, meeting each other uh, in virtual uh, space. And this year, in order to facilitate uh, the encounters, uh, to enable P uh, friends from all continents to come and participate, we have set this particular time slot so that, um, well, we hope as many people as possible could be attending. So we are very happy to be starting uh, the lecture and also the whole forum today uh, with our dear friend, uh, Gustavo Esteva. Uh, Gustavo um, is, uh, well, we met uh, with Gustavo together with Professor Dai Jinghua, who's here with us tonight and who's going to co-moderate with me. We went to Oaxaca in the year 2002, so that's uh, almost 20 years ago, and we were there in the, uh, at the Earth University, and we were very fortunate to be able to meet and talk with uh, Gustavo because I think we only gave one day's um, notice about our coming. <laughs> and fortunately, Gustavo was there. So uh, together with us at that time, we also had um, uh, Professor Wen Jin and also Professor Huan Ping. And so the four of us, uh, whom somebody called us the crazy Chinese team of four. Uh, we were there in uh, Mexico for uh, well, uh, quite for 14 days and traveling quite a lot. And we traveled uh, 3000 kilometers. And uh, we would remember that uh, when we met with Gustavo in the Earth University, Gustavo told us some of the stories um, of the of Gustavo's uh, grandmother, of uh, the, uh, his adventures, uh, well, in the um, corporate world, uh, and his disillusionment then, and then later, then uh, how he came to be uh, well with the Zapatistas and uh, helping the Zapatistas to uh, during the negotiation uh, for for their autonomy. And uh, since 1994, Gustavo has been a very important um, person mediating between the uh, Zapatistas in Chapas and also the, the world uh, outside. And um, it was uh, through the mediation of Gustavo and our friends, uh, Jorge San Diego uh, and others that uh, we have been able to be um, well, uh, in touch. And uh, together with uh, Professor uh, Dai Jinghua, then we managed to produce this book. <laughs> and uh, that book, it was uh, translated by Professor Dai Jinghua. She's, uh, she writes beautiful, beautiful prose. And so um, the book is um, rendered uh, in very beautiful prose in Chinese. 
and um, so uh, well, I would. Um, I'm actually very, very happy that this time uh, we could be having uh, Gustavo with us, uh, not only today but also later on uh, uh, on the uh, during the opening ceremony uh, this Friday, and also on January uh, on June on June uh, the thirtieth where we will be talking about the Zapatistas encountering the European movements. So uh, I will first like to uh, introduce my co uh, moderator, Professor Dai Jinghua. Uh, Professor Dai, uh, well, she's actually so well known that maybe she doesn't really need too much introduction. She is professor at the Institute of Comparative Literature and Culture, and also director of the Center for Film and Cultural Studies at Peking University. She's a very, very profound uh, writer. She has put, wrote many, many books and is uh, extremely popular with her students and with, her, with the young people. So students had to go very early uh, before her lecture in order to occupy some space. Otherwise they had to sit on the floor uh, well, near the doors. Uh, so uh, we are very happy that we have uh, Professor Dai today um, to be co-moderating. And so um, maybe uh, I'll now hand over the moderation uh, to uh, 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 Dai. And uh, so please turn on, uh, well, please keep to your English channel uh, to listen to the English. And we also have interpreting into Spanish and into Chinese. And uh, currently we are having this meeting both on Zoom and on the Xiao Ertong within China. And we have about 200 uh, participants uh, in China listening to this uh, lecture. So, Professor Dai, please. Good evening, everybody. I'm very honored to be the moderator for Gustavo. So, as um, Kim Chi uh, record um, how this 20 years we have met with uh, Gustavo, I am very eager and thrilled to be here today because I want to know from Gustavo the latest news from Gustavo. Since 1994, um, he has been with the indigenous people in forming a new type of social reform. And what is today, what today looks like? And I'm also, Hope to know that Gustavo also writes a lot. And then he writes about the postmodern grassroots development. So, and then he is also the founder of the Earth University. And that university he founded is so different from the university I am in. It is the same in the way that it is producing and it is creating wisdom and cultivating um, space for young people, but different in the way that, different in many ways, but they are also um, space and arena for social um, experiment. So now let's looking forward to the voices from Latin America. Uh, nowadays, we have too many bad newses. So we are really looking forward to hopeful newses. Um, the South-South Forum is always my hope in the summer. So I'm very looking forward to this summer as well. Good morning, good evening. It's a uh... Thank you for invite dear friends for inviting me to this great event. No face, no contact, no interaction with others, even the loved ones. They can contaminate you, even kill you by sharing their COVID-19. Confinement. Children plugged into the screen for hours, attending classes of a universal curriculum increasingly relevant for the life. Can we call this a human society, a humane society? Systematic destruction of Mother Earth, 
increasing violence and dismantling of the social fabric and the state of law with increasing illegal control of people's lives becomes the normal condition everywhere. In Mexico, 100 people are assassinated every day and immense areas have remained for years under criminal control. It has become increasingly difficult to draw a line between the world of the institutions and the world of crime. Evident in the past year are the extremes of national and global inequities exacerbated by COVID-19. Having lost jobs or income sources, millions were forced to reinvent themselves to survive. The Lancet was right. We're not suffering a pandemic. Since 2019, it wasn't that we are before a syndemic. The concurrent disease clusters and generalized chronic conditions emerging under health disparity and caused by poverty, stress, and structural violence. This approach departs from the biomedical approach, isolating and treating diseases as distinct entities, separated from other diseases and social conditions, as has been done with COVID-19. The Guardian was right. We are not before climate change or global warming. We are before a climate collapse. The climate we had is gone. We know nothing about the emerging climate. We don't know if it will be compatible with human life. The socio-political collapse is even worse. All the institutions defining our era are in open decadence, substituted by a dispositive that in many senses is the opposite of what they were. Under these conditions, confusion, uncertainty, and suffering among millions of people, and the disruption, deterioration, or destruction of living conditions constitute the real new normal. The entire world is embroiled in the long emergency. Multiple socioeconomic and political crises beginning in the 90s and exploding in 2008 produced unbearable conditions for millions of people around the world. In the face of converging catastrophes, the elite minority scrambled to secure their privilege while the majority of people experience the devastating effects of the current moment. Hunger, violence, incarceration, wealth income gaps, intractable wars, and the collapse of the democratic norms and institutions further demonstrate how attempts to address these problems via escalation of past solutions are doomed at the outset. Numerous scholars argue that the world has arrived at the point of no return. I am sorry for using all this time to bring to your attention the horror we all know too well. I just wanted to acknowledge it and to underline that it is the expression of a dying era. Like always, the dying regime, patriarchal, capitalist, and democratic, uses all its remaining forces to pretend it has more power than ever, that it is alive and well, and that soon we will be back to better conditions. Both prosperity and freedom for everyone will be restored or established for the first time. About that, 
dying era. Despite capitalism's global vocation, expressed in all forms of colonialism and imperialism, the nation state was always the main arena enabling capitalist expansion. In the later part of the 20th century, however, national borders increasingly posed an obstacle. Macronational structures like the European Union designed for the free movement of capital and commodities did not solve the problem. Consequently, neoliberal globalization began to erode the substance of the nation state. The main function of the nation state's governments, namely the administration of the national economy, became impossible with all economies being exposed to transnational movements beyond the control of individual nations. While national rituals and nation states themselves still persist as points of reference, the raison d'etre and the material substance giving them reality have disappeared. The progressive dissolution of the democratic nation state is also a consequence of the fact that capitalism has come up against its own internal limits. Since the 1970s, the so-called neoliberal revolution has brought about political, economic, and technological changes that have dismantled at the global level the social advances accumulated over 200 years of workers' struggle. The repercussions are evident everywhere. Dwindling employment levels, lower salaries, reduced fringe benefits, and deteriorating public services. Some countries and regions are more severely affected than others. Unprecedented levels of inequality have been created. Worldwide, 1% of the population owe more wealth than the other 99% combined. And fewer than 30 individuals hold more wealth between them than almost 4 billion of the world's poorest people. Most of what is produced in the world today still has a capitalist character. But capital can no longer resort to the mechanism that drives it, namely the investment of profits in the expansion of production by purchasing labor and balancing every labor reduced and increase in productivity with an equivalent increase in production. For these and other reasons, the worldwide reproduction of the capitalist system is no longer feasible. Capitalism evolution has in effect killed the goose that laid the golden eggs. In 1995, at the meeting of the State of the World Forum in San Francisco, economic and political leaders like Mikhail Gorbachev, George Bush, Margaret Thatcher, Baclav Hagel, Bill Gates, and Ted Turner began to talk about the 2080 world, namely the idea that once the technological revolution is complete, only 20% of the population will be necessary for, for production. In reality, it appears that a new social class has been created, disposable human beings, sometimes described as the precariat. In the past, the unemployed fulfilled a certain function for capital. They were its industrial reserve army. Now, capital has no use for this new class. Political and economic leaders are continually redefining the surplus population, incorporating 
ever more new groups of expendable humans. Barbarism has become the norm. Speculation, dispossession, and compulsive destruction are replacing production as a source of accumulation of wealth and power. The democratic facade is no longer useful. Of the old design of the nation state, only the dispositive for direct and indirect control of the population remain. The use of new technologies may usher in the extension of such oppressive control to previously unimaginable aspects and spheres of daily life. One pillar of the democratic nation state, the rule of law, was the culmination of 200 years of a struggle for civil rights and democratic freedoms. Today, it is being replaced by a declared or undeclared state of exception of the state of emergency. Everywhere, new laws are being used to normalize illegality and impunity for ever greater numbers of crimes. Mexico and the US are good examples of this general condition. Instead of the rule of law, common norms properly enforced, we are increasingly under the rule by law. The dominant irresponsible forms of production and consumption have wrought environmental destruction tantamount to extreme abuses of the most common basic of the most basic common sense. In the wake of rapid technological, environmental, and social changes, new forms of political domination are emerging. Political leaders with an open anti-democratic vocation and even fascist propensities are currently being elected or re-elected or are at least ascendant. Increasingly, people cleave desperately to fundamentalism, spiritual, religious, or political, even as the ideas and institutions in which they trusted dissolve before their disbelieving eyes. Democracy is being democratically dismantled almost everywhere. The 21st century is now characterized by the proliferation of discontent, even in the most unexpected places. No space or social reality is immune. Even those who have concentrated <clears throat> an obscene proportion of wealth in their hands recognize the instability and dangers <clears throat> inherent in the current state of affairs. In my view, all this is but the expression of the current transition. And I want to talk about the world's emerging in the, the world emerging in the gloom of in the old, about the new era. <clears throat> 25 years ago, Ivan Illich observed that friendship can no longer flower out of political life. I do believe, he said, that if there is something like a political life to remain for us in the world of technology, then it begins with friendship. I want to assume seriously the observ this observation and even more. I want to suggest that friendship is at the very center of the path guiding us to the new world and allowing us to escape from the dying era. What we need to do, said Illich, is to cultivate disciplined, self-denying, careful, tasteful friendships. Perhaps, he added, here we can find what the good is. This is the central point because to find what the good is, the common good is the very definition of politics. 
it is the political life still open to us. Illich added, this goes beyond anything which people usually talk about, saying each one is responsible for the friendship he, she can develop. Because society will only be as good as the political result of these friendships. Illich was a man of action, a political man, and we can thus understand how and why friendship became for him his sin, his obsession, the center of his life. And he knew very well how to be friends. I would like to tell a story of one of his friendships that I find particularly pertinent for the current moment, for our predicament, and about the new world. To be acquainted with Latin America, Illich looked for the advice of the Bishop Dom Helder Camara in Brazil. Every day, Dom Helder gave to Ivan one book of a Brazilian author, and the next day he introduced the author to him. That is how Illich met Freire, and they became friends from the very first day. Dom Helder also told Ivan that to know Latin America, he needed to talk it, to walk it. He walked the favelas of Rio with Freire. And later he walked alone from Santiago de Chile to Caracas in Venezuela, just to know us, the people in this area of the world. Just later, when Freire was put in jail <clears throat> by the Brazilian dictatorship, Illich used all his political influence to get him out of jail and bring him to this center, to his center, the CIDOC in Cuernavaca, Mexico. He translated and published there Freire's first books. In some editions of the Pedagogy of the Press, you can still find an Illich sentence. Here, you have a really revolutionary pedagogy. They had many things in common. They shared the critique of what Freire called the banking education and capitalism. Both of them wanted a profound social and political change, but they also had profound differences and soon parted ways. Freire dedicated his life to implement his ideas, promoting literacy campaigns and popular education. He was not addressing the masses, but a group of mediators who would use conscientization to educate the masses in their own liberation. His popular educators were soon everywhere and became particularly prominent in Latin America. Ivan parted ways with Freire when he moved from the criticism of schooling to the criticism of what education does to society. Namely, foster the belief that people have to be helped to gain insights into reality and have to be helped to prepare for existence or for living. He thus focused on the social conditions in which education may appear as a need, as a means for survival, as the only way to become a legitimate citizen. He was asking himself what kind of society wants to educate its member, all its members in the same way. He knew the answer. The modern society was the first that wanted to shape all its member in a certain way. What we call education in the modern era was born with capitalism and for the same purpose. Ivan dedicated his life and work to dismantle the dominant regime. He knew pretty well its patriarchal nature and the need to dismantle the economic society, capitalist or socialist, and to also dismantle the nation state, the political form of capitalism supposedly democratic. He wrote against conscientization about the mediators, even against the magnificent and very popular Freire educators. For the change, 
he was not appealing to a leader, a vanguard, a party, or any kind of mediator, but to the people themselves, ordinary men and women at the grassroots. He assumed that they will create coalitions of discontents. In spite of that increasing divergence, Illich cultivated his friendship with Freire with discipline and care, a tasteful friendship until Freire's death. Here I find a very important lesson, lesson for those fighting among them, among themselves all the time, even for marginal differences and creating separation and division, particularly in groups in the left. In this case, Illich and Freire were openly militating in opposite trenches in the war against capitalism and the dominant regime. While Freire, as I said, was involved in literacy campaign to bring the alphabet to the masses and try to apply his revolutionary pedagogy everywhere to transform public and private education, Illich was openly and courageously struggling against both literacy and education but they remained good friends. 10 years after the publication of the Schooling Society, the most famous of Illich books and the least understood, he confessed that he had been barking at the wrong tree, that at the end of the 20th century, the whole society was educating its members in a certain way, formatting them to become subsystems of a system in the society of control. He was thus struggling against all forms of education, not only the school, and against the whole structure behind education. I could like to reflect on these points that in my view are central to open ourselves to the new world. Literacy campaign, as well as the program's teaching of how to learn and write in the school, generate three forms of radical disqualification. First of all, literacy disqualifies at least a billion people on earth, the illiterate adults, many of which have often assumed their own inferiority because they lack the specific ability of reading and writing. One can often hear a very wise peasant saying that perhaps what he's saying is totally wrong because he does not know how to read and write and has no school. The role attributed to literacy in the society creates a damaging form of illegitimate hierarchy. Literacy also disqualifies reading the fact that it is imposed, often in very inadequate conditions, provokes that people abandon reading as soon as they can. According to UNESCO, a person can be called a reader if he or she reads more than five books per year. In no country in the world, the proportion of readers is more than 20% of the population not even in countries with 99% of literacy like the US or in countries like India, Thailand, and China that have the highest number of hours of reading per week. Many studies have shown that those who learn it freely how to read by their own will, love to do it and usually read many books per year. Literacy radically disqualifies oral civilizations and devalues their way of thinking, remembering, or living, which means not only to disqualify many people still living in the oral civilizations that survive, survive against all odds, but also the value its contributions to the understanding of the world and to define what is a good life. We currently have in Mexico magnificent examples of what happens with children and adults that learn to read and write in freedom for the joy of it, 
not for any external imposition. Many of us are today openly opposing all forms of literacy, particularly for children. We are also resisting all forms of education inside and outside public or private institutions. The school is a dispositive that clearly spoils the spontaneous behavior of children and their opportunities to grow and learn in freedom. There is no system more despotic than the classroom where the teacher has the power and the truth and supposedly does everything for the benefit of the students he or she controls. That is how the fascist in us all is created. The fascist denounced by Foucault when he wrote about the one that is in our heads and in our everyday behavior, the fascism that causes us to love power, to desire the very thing that dominates and exploits us. There is something more. Education castrates our imagination, making almost impossible to think a social organization without hierarchy, without a structure of command and control. That is exactly, exactly the kind of organization we need now to really care for life and survive. Something that is almost a definition of the new world, which should be constructed beyond any form of patriarchy. In the case of children, we are explicitly for the disciplined cultivation of their passion to learn that they have since they are babies and to open for them opportunities to discover what they want to learn. We are trying to recuperate all forms and traditions of apprenticeship and the conditions for all people, children and adults, to learn in freedom by doing what, by doing what they want to learn, which is, by the way, how we all learn most of what we do in our daily life. What we need to do, said Illich, is to cultivate disciplined, self-denying, careful, tasteful friendships. <clears throat> we can construct with them the alternatives to the powers oppressing us. In my view, that is exactly what is happening today in the world and becomes a very solid source of hope. And it is happening in a convivial climate of friendship. There is today an extended search for alternative ways of learning. Never before was something like this. What the government imposed in the name of COVID-19 allowed the parents to experience directly the school setting. Many of them could no longer accept that form of oppression for their children. Resistance similar to that opposing the establishment of the school system started to proliferate. A million students abandoned the school in Mexico during the last year with the support of their parents. All kinds of learning practices are being adopted everywhere. In many cases, groups of friends come together to conceive and implement the alternatives. The public system of education in the Oaxaca, in the south of Mexico, where I live, a courageous struggle of the teachers got from the educational authorities permission for an experiment in a number of public schools. When the children arrive for the first day of classes in high school, the teachers tell them that there will not be classes, classroom, disciplines, or grades, or other evaluations. With two to five friends, they should conceive one or several projects to develop by themselves in the course of the next three years. 
They can talk with their parents, the elders, the authorities in the community to confirm the communal value of the projects and then develop them. The teachers will have two functions, to protect the children from any educational inspector approaching the school who will not be allowed to talk with them and to offer them some advice and support if they cannot solve some aspects of their projects. The results of these experiments are very impressive, particularly by rooting their children in their own places, which is exactly the opposite to what the school was doing to them, of rooting them, creating the desire to abandon their communities for an illusory improvement in the cities or other places. Years ago, we started to observe in villages and barrios, particularly among indigenous peoples, a radical reaction against education and schools. A few of them closed their schools and expelled their teachers. Most of them avoided this type of political conflict and started instead to just bypass the school while reclaiming and regenerating the conditions in which people traditionally learned in their own ways. They came to this point after a long experience and for many years they resisted the school. In 1954, the UNESCO complained that the main obstacle to education was the indifference of parents to sending their children to school. 15 years later, no Latin American country has been able since then to they had to notice that the demand for schooling exceeded the number of available classrooms by seven times. The UNESCO campaign was very successful. The parents were educated in the need to send the children to the school, only to find that there were not enough schools and teachers. No Latin American country has been able since then to satisfy the demand for education. More and more people, the people suffered the damages of schooling their children and participated in all kinds of ex ex efforts to reform, widen or improve the system. And finally, many of them said basta, enough, like the Zapatistas. They know now very well what is happening. Benjamin Maldonado, an anthropologist, verified it using a variety of tests. He compared children going to a school with those out of the school. He wanted to teach lessons to the parents, to tell them, see what you are doing to your poor children, uh, letting them, putting them behind. After the study, after the tests, those out of the school knew more about everything including reading and writing, except the national anthem. To know the national anthem was the only advantage of those going to the school. And those going to the school, looking down on their communities and cultures and had subordinated their minds and hearts to the authority of the teacher. The indigenous school as a path towards ignorance is the title of Maldonado's report. In fact, the people in the village know very well that the school prevents their children from learning what is needed to continue living in their communities, contributing to their common flourishing and that of their soils, their places. And it does not offer them an appropriate preparation for life or work out of the community. They are no longer delegating their children's learning to the school. True. Many of them don't dare as yet to take their children out of primary school. They don't want to deprive them of the school diploma, a required passport in the modern society, whose lack is a continual source of discrimination and humiliation. But even those still sending their children to a school in our communities have now many ways of damage control both supporting their children in active resistance at the school and creating for them alternative opportunities to learn whatever they have a passion or talent for. 
we are increasingly convinced that radically de-schooling the world can be today the most important change than anyone can conceive for a new society. It implies a complete reorganization of our lives. I'm not suggesting to call all the schools tomorrow morning or anytime near, which is obviously impossible and may become counterproductive. The most important point is to de-school ourselves, our minds and hearts, and then begin to appropriate the appropriate organization of the society. Convinced that education is the very foundation of the current society and its oppression. To escape from it requires to dismantle such foundation. It is a precondition for a real change, for the construction of the new society. What about the teachers? There are many people who have dedicated their whole life to teaching with love, care, and commitment. Are they doomed? In my view, they are doomed by the system. They are no longer useful for the purpose of shaping the people in a certain way. They may be put in the category of dispensable humans. Most universities and schools are already feeling the reduction of budgets and the experiment of 2020 creating the possibility, created the possibility of disposing of the teachers. Like millions of people, the teachers may try to reinvent themselves and they can make immense contributions for the needed changes. If they begin to abandon the idea of the curriculum and the obsession of transferring certain knowledge and abilities to the children and youth, if they construct an alliance with them to organize way to learn in freedom and create apprenticeships, if they assume themselves as committed actors of a transformation that substitute nouns creating dependence like education or health for verbs relying on autonomous agency, learning, healing, they can become one of the best pillars of a peaceful transition. It seems to be, seems to be a common experience that we learn better when nobody is teaching us. We learn better from a master when he or she is not teaching us. We can observe this in every baby and in our own experience. Our vital competence comes from learning by doing without any kind of teaching. It seems easy and accessible for everyone to escape from education in that very sense. We have learned with the Zapatistas that while changing the world is very difficult, perhaps impossible, it is possible to create a whole new world. That is exactly what the Zapatistas are doing in the south of Mexico. How can we create our own new world at our own small human scale? How can we de-school our lives and those of our children in this real world where the school still dominates minds, hearts, and institutions? Friendship is a central component of the answer. Real freedom is of course a fundamental condition for friendship to flourish, but not freedom in the abstract or in political bodies. You can befriend someone in jail or a concentration camp, also in a school, but there should, be not, there, there should not be a strings attached to the relationship between good befriends no conditions imposed, no rules or restrictions. At the end of the schooling society, where he elaborates on his not very smart proposals, Ivan wrote, what characterizes the true master discipline relationship is its priceless character. Aristotle speaks of it as a moral type of friendship, which is not in fixed terms. It makes a gift or does whatever it does as to a friend. Thomas Aquinas says of this kind of teaching that inevitable is this an act of love and mercy. 
This kind of teaching is always a luxury for the teacher and a form of leisure in Greek scholar for him and his pupil. An activity meaningful for both having no ulterior purpose. That is the main point in friendship, gratis. Not only because there is no economic change involved, but because you are doing what you are doing for the joy of it, having no ulterior purpose, gratis. Learning together is not a means towards an end, but an end in itself for the joy of it. It is a pleasure to do it with friends as an expression of friendship. That is, in my view, what is happening around the world. Friends come together and begin learning what they can do in the current transition. Which are the challenges of the current horror? How can you begin an alternative path together with friends? There is another component of this path that we must consider carefully with open eyes. Working with indigenous communities brought us back from the future years ago. There, you don't have expectations, you have hopes. In Spanish, we have a beautiful expression to say that you have hopes, abrigo esperanzas, that is, I wrap my hopes up well for them not to freeze. You nourish your hopes, you care for them, as Ivan once said, hope means trust in faith in the goodness of nature, while expectation means reliance on result, results which are planned and controlled by man. Hope centers the size on a person from, 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 from whom we await a gift. Expectation looks forward to satisfaction from a predictable process which will produce what we have the right to claim. Anilich also warned us, the Promethean ethos has now eclipsed hope. Survival of the human race depends on its rediscovery as a social force. At the end of the intercontinental encounter against neoliberalism, the Zapatistas giving a new use to all leftist jargon suggested the creation of the International of Hope. Using words as their main weapon, the Zapatistas rediscovered hope as a social force and opened a whole new avenue of transformation for all of us. Radical hope is the very essence of popular movements. Pe people start some action with a conviction that their mobilization may bring the changes they are looking for. But we need to be aware that hope is not the conviction that something will happen in a certain way, but the conviction that something makes sense no matter what happens. Hope should be associated with hospitality, recovering threshold, table, patience, listening, and from there generating seed beds, seed beds for virtue and friendship on the one hand. On the other hand, radiating out for possible community, for rebirth of community. Hope and friendship, hope and friendship are indeed key in the path to recovering the commons community. For many years, we all have been orienting our lives as a projections to the future. It looked sensible and pertinent because there were some deep trends that allowed us to anticipate what will happen in the future. Tomorrow looked more or less like today. Many predictions failed, of course. You cannot know the future, but it was possible to anticipate certain evolution based on past experience. Agronomic wisdom was based in the careful observation of nature to detect timely some signals that allowed to anticipate the probable evolution of natural phenomena. If we will have or not enough rain, if we need or not to change the date to put the seeds. Something similar was done with social, economic and political events. It was possible to anticipate the evolution of the main phenomena 
affecting us. We need to be aware that such condition entirely changed. We have entered the time of radical uncertainty. We don't know what will happen. Natural and social phenomena became unpredictable. The deep trends allowing us to foresee what will happen are no longer there. We don't know. In a very real sense, that only means to come back to our senses. We never knew for sure. We are now consciously open to surprise. Yes, we are now coming back from the future, living in the present, living in our own places, not in search of any kind of mobility which will take us to the centers of power of the global economy. To be back from the future means to resist the temptation of pretending to know the future, and even worse, to be able to control it. To resist the sin of pretending to know what our children and young people will need, what they will want, not today or tomorrow, but in a year, in 10 years, in 20 years, the rest of their lives. To resist the idea that we can plan a learning process for them to be prepared in a distant future for something that we pretend that we know today. A plan defining the knowledge, skills, or dispositions that they all may need as preparation for life or work, even if we cannot know what kind of life or work they will have, in what kind of planet they will live. To be back from the future means to be living in the present, instead of seeing virtue. Virtue, that is, shape order and direction of actions informed by tradition, bounded by place, and qualified by choices made within the habitual reach of the actor. Virtue is practice mutually recognized as being good within a shared local culture which enhances the memory of a place. Back from the future means to be here, talking with friends, Instead of staying physically here, but only in transit, you're being going someplace else. The question is really living instead of going. To be a student means in a sense to stop living in order to just go, to go for the grade, the diploma, the job. Back from the future means resisting the idea of goals, having them, dreaming about them, reaching them. Yes, I know in some contexts, if the parents find that their 12 years old has no goals, they immediately call a ring. Apparently, in some societies, you cannot survive without goals. In other places, to have goals is a sin. I know nothing about the future, except that it does not exist, and I don't know if it will exist for me. I have no goals. My grandmother passed away when she was 96 years old, ignoring what it is to have a disease or to be infected by a goal. We have motives, impulses, forces rooted in present, giving us direction and meaning in our living present. True learning, true learning Illich once said, can only be the leisurely practice of free people. In the consumer society, he also said, we are either prisoners of addiction or prisoners of envy. Only without addiction or envy, only without educational goals in freedom, we can enjoy true learning. In my place, every I is a we, and thus we live together in our living present rooted in our social and cultural soil, nourishing hopes with friends at the time in which all of us, inspired by the Zapatistas, are creating a whole new world open to surprise, the surprise of another era. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo. That is uh, such a beautiful speech. And um, you talked about um, uh, 
friendship, uh, hope, and surprise. And uh, so when I first uh, read your title, I was wondering um, what you would be talking about uh, in terms of surprise. I think uh, well, for friendship, then I could see that it is um, well, the question of uh, relations with others and uh, hope Then we have talked about a lot. But for this surprise, I think um, it is one of the keywords that we could be looking into. And, uh, and I think that is also opening up a lot of um, uh, uh, spaces and also uh, uh, possibilities so that uh, we could be thinking the impossible and also doing the impossible. So uh, now I would like to first um, invite my co uh, moderator, um, Da Jinghua, uh, to say, uh, uh, to respond uh, to your um, uh, speech. So, Da uh, Shi. Thank you, Gustavo. Thank you for your speech, and also thank you, Professor Lau, for such a uh, for giving me such an opportunity to give a reply. But actually, it's almost impossible because Gustavo, uh, thinking, contemplation are also original. So lots of the things, lots of the turns, I is for me is also the first time. So it's almost quite a challenge for me to give some reply to his speech. So what I can do is to follow his um, follow his ideas and to share some of my own thoughts. What we are doing, what we are going through now, it's uh, unpresent, unpresentable, the so-called so -called COVID-19 pandemic. As far as I know, there has never been such a catastrophe in human history that has affected the whole globe. That is uh, act on almost everyone on, on the planet. On one side is the human that has uh, that has suffered from from the from the from this uh, the outcome of this pandemic. On the on the other hand, we can see that every I every every individ individualities are also going through it, but in different levels. On one side, we can see it is affected every, it is affected every country, every people without any border. But on the other side, we can see the border are actually reinforced and the peoples are confined. From the moment when the pandemic starts, there are also lots of, uh, voices, many uh, optimistic voices about like we are talking about the post pandemic war post post -pan pandemic, uh, post pandemic uh, life. But the thing is, we have to think about what this virus has been this pandemic has been telling us or what it has changed. And also, there are also not many people to discuss about how this pandemic started and what it had told us or, or try to warm us as a human race. We should have, we should have some, some, uh, some change, some change, we should have, uh, we should have done some change in order to go through it and also after this, but not many people have been thinking about it. So that is what my, I have been thinking about when Gustavo just come up with the whole situation that the so-called the date, the end era, and that is what I have been thinking. And also another thing that also caused, also make me thinking is like this one point I have been, I have been talking about for a long time is like rather than telling people that I said this, I have told you this. Actually, you sh I, this is something that I've been telling myself for many times, like which is in order to have a future, in order to have a future as a common, as a common, to recognize what we have to, we have to acknowledge the fact that we don't know anything about about our future. 
So this is like in to some extent um, to reply to what Gustavo has said that we don't know nothing about future. We 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 have zero knowledge about it. So we have to come back from the future. I really like his uh, his phrase of uh, his points about this that we have to come back from the future because we don't even know about today. We without knowing today, how can we talk about future? The future is void. The future is also controlled by the pre uh, dominant the dominant regime is kind of kidnapped and also consumed uh, or predict by the dominant region of today so when we when we recognize the point that we don't know nothing when we acknowledge it then we can start to think that maybe we can have We can have a version, maybe at least not as war, as bad as what we're having today. So this is one point that I am really exciting about when I just heard what Gustavo said and also took notes. So, and also another uh, two points, an interesting points I want to mention is that one point is about education. The other one is about friendship. I, to my surprise that Gustavo is is uh, kind of uh, has taken a step further. He is already talking about anti anti uh, education. Already start to critic. Uh, already started uh, critic on uh, Freire, because I just started to learn from uh, Freire's uh, deschooling education. But but Gustavo has already took one step further already all the way to Elige about how to uh, the, the, the the about his practice of uh, of uh, the education the schooling and uh, all of this uh, uh, practice so because nowadays we can see this the kids are really just plugged into the computer to continue their school education so when things like this happen lots of things lots of problems are are uncovered so in this kind of new situation and also kind of uh, very resilient to stay. The education's problems, all these inequalities that already presented by the education, every parent in China, I believe, have been experiencing all of the above, but I am not as radical. And in my observation of the um, post Cold War world, one of the observations that really hurts me is that we can see that in the world where where the alternatives are deprived, we can see that the the society inequalities are really the gap are really are really bewildering, and also we can see the hopes are also deprived. At the same time, we can see the depression or the pessimism are also dismissing. So in this kind of situation, the chance, the possibility of self-learning to, to set up your own life's goals in front of such a strong force Is it still possible to grow out of these people who are deprived, who are already lost their, who have already lost their hopes? For me, actually, my answer is really uncertain. I, I have my doubts to this question, but I still have this strong belief. Is because I we still have to survive. In our, in our reality we still have to keep moving forward because life continues the time continues so we we have to have this hope we have to embrace this hope Gustavo also in his speech mentioned friendship and also stressing on this point. I might use another word that is 
might be more cliche is about an encounter, a sincere, a sincere, a physical encounter or a coexist co coexistence and to see each other between human beings and also to accept each other. And this is what uh, I, I, I would call as like a real, a real coexistence, although sometimes it's not as satisfied, but it is a real love that is out from life. It is not, it's not like uh, Nakarsi's uh, self-love, self-pity. It's not a camera that is, that is uh, like taking a selfie for yourself, but with your eyes to look at the world. Just like when when we, we when, that's just like as our encounter with the Sapatas. So I also like Gustavo saying of how to walk our land because only when we are walking on our lands, we can really, we can really um, walk out of this imagination that is created. We can really walk into the real, real people or real, uh, real life to really have this kind of encounter with people who, who is different from us and to create, try to all at least try to create a, a kind of love and a kind of uh, friendship. Sometimes when I was having, having, uh, having conversation with the young, younger generation, maybe for today's pop culture or for today's, today's this kind of imaginations, love is also kind of uh, difficult, but love is, is in our limited life. That is the only possible thing, which is the most beautiful thing as well is a gift and this gift is this gift is priceless only with contributions only with some only with some effort then we can have it so let me come back to some maybe some old old knowledge and old stuff that we have learned long time ago, which comes from the, our first few encounters with the uh, Zapatistas. Out from their land, from their space, time space, from the indigenous and the indigenous community and the mixed blood, mixed people. When Professor Lau and I were editing the book of the Marx Knights, one of the things that attract me most is their actions and their writings and their resistance, their dreams. And also the joy that has come out from all of those. Maybe it's a surprise and also hope as mentioned by Gustavo. Also when we were in the, the University of Tierra, when we were in the visiting the school, we also see all those beautiful colors, brilliant colors used by the indigenous people. And when we when we saw all those hand, hand, handcrafts that met by met by them with also many vivid colors, the clothes, etc. Also, when we were reading the writings of Subcomande. We all read all, all, we can read all of those beautiful colors. Well, I still remember some phrases written by Subcomande uh, Marcos. One phrase is that we have to laugh out loud. When our laughters are like the raindrops coming from the sky, who is, tell me who is going to win, who is going to lose. I really love his kind, his his expression, like very poetic expressions. He also said, "You have to look with your eyes. You can see this that the earth is as blue as an orange." I really like this kind of um, poetic uh, comparison, like uh, the blue earth and with the very bright orange. 
and also when I when I learned that they actually lived in a very difficult situation, they are people that have been suffering. Their laughter, their colors and hopes are so valuable to me. And also till today, this kind of culture and hope are still the, the, the oxidant to me. And I hope it will be a, a kind of the oxidant to the whole world to save us from the uh, cities, uh, from this kind of despair and to help us to keep working forward. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lau and Gustavo. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Dai. Actually, um, I've invited uh, Professor Dai to be with us so that she could be, uh, give uh, her long response to um, uh, to to Gustavo. We have quite a number of friends uh, here and I don't know whether I could surprise Samuel Lee, uh, whether you would say something. Samuel Lee is also a very respected um, uh, friend and uh, he has been, he has worked uh, with the uh, UNESCO uh, in Asia. He's uh, from uh, Korea and um, I've known him also for, uh, well, over 20 years. And Samuel, uh, it's um, such a pleasure also to see you here tonight. So please. No, I, I have just enjoyed uh, listening and then uh, I wanted to learn uh, more about, about uh, the, your, 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 uh, the, the, the concept of the sustainability and then um, the ways of making hopes huh, for for the whole whole world in in, in this kind of catastrophic uh, you know uh, time and world. Uh, so uh, I have an, uh, enjoyed the uh, your your uh, Gustavo's uh, uh, experience of uh, how to uh, make a friendship and then uh, cultivate a good friendship. Uh, which, which can be also some kind of uh, resilience and power for, of the people uh, to change the world and then uh, bring some new uh, uh, ways of societies. So uh, I, I think it was very much impressive uh, uh, to hear of your experience, especially in Mexico and Latin America and uh, uh, how you have tried to change uh, the, your your society uh, through uh, this kind of new way of uh, uh, making friendship and also uh, making new consciousness uh, of the people uh, to uh, to realize the reality and the truth uh, uh, and and also uh, to find a new way of uh, uh, changing your, your life and then a uh, very hopeful world. Well, thank you. I have enjoyed. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. And I know it is uh, already 12.30 in the early morning for you. And thank you for staying up there so late uh, and be with us. <laughs> yes. So um, would anyone like to speak? Uh, Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm May and I currently study in Australia and I and I am Chinese actually and I learning teaching here and I also study something about education um, in Australia Deakin University and um, I found uh, today's speech is talking about the learning from the natural or something and that is exactly the same value and same uh, priority uh, as Australian uh, education but actually I don't think this way of education is really, really good because Australian um, recently, uh, last few years, they changed their curriculum from the modern one, the Western one into like they change the um, Australian indig uh, indigenous people's value. And all of us, even our, even us, are, uh, the international student, we need to learn something about indigenous culture here. 
but um, eventually I found that this way of education is kind of divided people into two groups. Indigenous people, they will start, they will stay uh, in, their, uh, in their living area and they have no chance to have, have the, the developments and they were just learning something about um, that they, they will have the less chance to learn something about the modern society. Um, I want to know, is this a way to divide the people in different groups by their backgrounds? Thank you. And uh, can I, as since you talk about Australia, I can also see a friend, uh, Ashley from Australia. So Ashley, would you like to say something? Uh, just listening to the previous speaker, it, it is true that in Australia in recent years, there's been a change in curriculum and the overall Australian society where, uh, not the overall Australian society, but from, from the government where, um, there's more concern towards the indigenous people after having had, I suppose, uh, close to 200 years of uh, pretty extreme racism and uh, where they re were regarded as uh, second-class citizens. And, uh, but in, in recent, recent years, in the, in the last few decades, there has been a big change to, um, uh, to appreciate their culture, but at, 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 and and to promote Aboriginal learning, uh, but at, at one level, it's 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 sort of superficial because it's it's being it is being taught and it's being it's it's better understood within the wider community, uh, but but not not across all areas of the community, but it's better understood, but it's still not addressing a whole lot of uh, problems that uh, are currently, uh, and <laughs> for historical reasons, the Aboriginal people are in, uh, a, a lot of the Aboriginal people are, are in, still living in terrible conditions, um, poverty, uh, there is racism, there's still within the, the broader the... community, there's not an understanding of their culture or of their different ways of, living and within the Aboriginal communities there were something like 500 different languages here and you can have have uh, people they'll speak several different languages and English might be their third or fourth language but and there, there is a big problem with um, trying to get trying to educate in the Western system Aboriginal children it's hard to get them to schools and um, and our way of trying to educate them is not working. And, um, and so that, what, what Eduardo was talking about, uh, moving away from education, but having a different form of learning, um, sort of resonated for me with the, with the, um, uh, perhaps as a way of, um, helping the indigenous people here. Uh, so that was that's something that, that I was thinking. I also have a, a, a question from the uh, from the audience in China. So they say that it uh, if I, uh, we just hear about a friendship and hope and love, these are all very beautiful words, and uh, uh, most people would want to uh, have these. But then when you say uh, we should be, is, but then do you mean that? We shouldn't have any school or any teaching and just let the students be befriend each other and have do their own projects. So how about the learning about science where because science now is so important in our society today and also if they cannot get the diploma. So how could they be um, well moving on uh, in society? So uh, so would these um, would uh, what you be what you are saying be uh, rather idealistic and utopian, but then um, cannot um, help one to 
go along in the reality. So there's also the question, uh, the, uh, a comment also on the Q&A on the chat, uh, so that it is, uh, well, it's sometimes such a, so easy to talk about things, but then sometimes it is extremely arduous and it's almost impossible. So it seems that uh, when we hear uh, some uh, the alternative um, views from Gustavo or from others, then uh, from the more uh, so-called pragmatic or realistic uh, views, then they seem too, too utop utopian uh, and it's almost impossible. So, but then on the other hand, we also realize that we are so, um, I think uh, Gustavo also started with uh, describing all the horrors of the reality, which we all uh, understand and would agree with. So how do we deal with these contradictions? The horrors of the reality seem so real, uh, so seem so close to us. And yet at the same time, when we talk about hope and love and friendship, so uh, they seem so remote. So uh, how, how could that be? And uh, well, we have one comment from uh, uh, a friend here that uh, while Gustavo was talking, he drew a picture. Uh, <laughs> so, so this, this is for you, <laughs> Gustavo. <really Okay>. <laughs> Yes, so this is a uh, well, just in case you are not sure if it's you, then the name is there. So you are named. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yes. So, um, Gustavo, uh, maybe how about if you respond to what um, Dai was saying or the others uh, commenting on, and then, uh, well, maybe you could take. 15 minutes or so and then we could have because we still have the book launch we have the book launch because we've uh, just produced the book so please Gustavo the, um, the time is yours thank you thank you of course um, I really loved um, uh, what professor Dai said I, I I really like it very much what he what she said in fact um, she is remembering us that we cannot really live without hope, uh, that we need hope to live. Uh, the Mahabharata, the sacred book of India, says that um, to lose hope is like dying, that if you don't hope, you don't have hope, you are really dying. And this is my concern because many people, as she said, is losing hope. And it's almost desperate in these current conditions because of the horror. And then what it is, uh, yes, there is an option and, and yes, uh, love and friendship is a gift. And, and, and this idea that she suggested that is uh, this encounter that is to accept each other. Um, it's the only possible way to, to really interact. But uh, I would like to, to say that um, let's think a little, let's connect these reflections of Professor Dai uh, with the last intervention and uh, saying that perhaps uh, we are not connecting with reality, that this looks great to talk about friendship and hope and all these kind of beautiful things and not about reality and, and, and that uh, people need the diplomas. Um, Yes, I am saying that here in uh, Oaxaca, many people are not abandoning uh, the idea that their children can have the diplomas, that there is a passport in the modern society. But at the same time, people are not stupid and people are seeing what is happening. And now they can see in many countries, not only in Mexico, that you have an engineer or a philosopher driving a taxi because there are no jobs for the people. Uh, there is a study saying that only 8%, 8% of all the graduates of Mexican universities will ever work in whatever they studied. Then yes, the people are still looking for the diplomas, but the diplomas are no longer producing what they produced. When many years ago I started my studies, uh, when in my first years in university, three jobs were waiting for us. 
And before we concluded our studies, we had already those jobs. They were offering those jobs for their professions, for the new professions, etc. That is not the case today. There will not be jobs for everyone. And no matter what kind of diploma you have, you will not be able to work in whatever you, st you study. And then the people are reacting to this reality. Yes, people don't dare to abandon putting the children to get the diplomas. But at the same time, uh, they know what is happening with the diplomas. And they're trying to discover, trying to reinvent themselves and to find in the reality what to do. Let me put a very concrete example. Oaxaca uh, had thousands and thousands of people living on tourism. They were not only waiters and, and people uh, working in the hotels and restaurants, but people selling things to the tourist goods and services. No tourists are coming anymore. And they will not come again. They will not come back again. They need to reinvent themselves. And no diploma can be really useful for them to reinvent themselves in these conditions. And there are many things that they can learn in real life with friends to survive, to live a good life, to live the life they want, the life can, they can create by themselves. And that does not require any kind of diploma. And let me say a few words about uh, science. Uh, apparently it's so important to learn science and to know science. If you see what is happening first with the real value of science and what kind of science we have. We have all the science in the world and uh, no scientist can really characterize COVID-19 after 15 months. <laughs> they cannot tell you exactly what it is. They have been studying this for 20 years and they have been talking all the time about the scientific conclusions to all the rules they imposed in the whole world. They don't have any real foundations for what they are saying. They are talking about science, but not really have any scientific foundations. And we are using the word science now for many kinds of different things. Yes, uh, we need to know and we, learn, we need to know how to learn science. And it is not just sitting in a classroom listen to and listening to a guy with big, great explanations. We need to know that uh, to really learn science, you need to do science, to, to do the things, to do the experiments, to do the observations by yourself, and then you are learning science. This is just, again, coming back to reality. This is a new reality. We need to uh, stop believing the dogmas in which we were educated. And we need to open our eyes to the new reality and to be really open to surprise. I loved many things that was, were said by Ashley. And one of the many very important things today is to learn to the Aboriginal people, to the indigenous people. Uh, they resisted many things of modernity, and then they have a wisdom. Uh, they have an experience from which we can learn a lot of things. We need to learn how to live. We need to acknowledge the otherness of the other, that perhaps we cannot understand them, but we can communicate with them heart to heart and learn with them about how to live in a world of, of diversity, the new world, and, and really, um, I must say that I am resisting uh, all kind of utopias that uh, saying that uh, we are now back from the future is again coming back from utopias. For a hundred years, we tried all kind of utopias. We were organizing ourselves to go to a certain place in the future, to a kind of paradise promised to us. If we do this and that, then we will have the new society beautiful uh, ahead of us. All the attempts of reforms and revolution failed in the 20th century. We did not get the changes we wanted. We did not get the hopes we had, we put in these revolutions and these reforms. Uh, it is a time to acknowledge that no reform or no revolution will bring the changes we want. 
we need a new narrative a new story, putting all the stories of the past and all the uh, experiences of the present in our living present to produce the changes we want. And we need to come back from the abstractions or taking the abstractions for real, uh, assuming that we can change the world, we change capitalism, we will change the global planet. We can change what we can change with our hands, with our friends, with our eyes in our real world. That is the only world that we can change. And that is exactly what is happening. Um, in, if I, I, in, in a minute more, I will say something. We know very well that this, uh, the pandemic, COVID-19, etc., is coming because of the damages done in the world by agribusiness. That we have a very serious problem because agribusiness destroying the planet Every, everywhere, what they are doing to the soil, to, the, to, the, to, to nature. And we know that the food they are offering us is full of toxic food. It's toxic, we, we are intoxicated by the food they are offering us in the market. But uh, let me say something very clear. A small peasants, mainly women, are feeding today today, 70% of the people on earth. And that means that agribusiness that owns half of or controls half of uh, the land and production of food in the world feeds only 30%. That is our hope, uh, Kinchi. That is what we are looking for. It is just simple peasants, simple people, mainly women guiding us. After March 8 of 2020, they broke uh, the normal sea of patriarchy, and then we are opened by women, by little peasants, by common men and women. They are guiding us to the new society. That is our source of hope. Let's be open to the surprise of real people changing every day, our stopping, resisting the horror and creating a new possibility. That is our main source of hope, in chief. Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, 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 Dai Lao Shi, uh, would you like to say something? Yes, please. Dai Lao Shi. I really wanted to say a few words because there are some questions earlier which are very typical and also 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 um, pointed out what's what the, the doubts that I really have also in my heart. So I would like to answer that question, which is in front of such a reality, such a pandemic, the difficulties that we are going through every day in daily life and in the hope of, 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 of a friendship, it seems quite quite unrealistic, seems like impossible, but my real, I, what I really ex experience is that is, it is because we are facing such a reality that makes the, the hope and love become necessary because if we don't to, if we don't create a hope, if we don't embrace our hope, then what awaits us? Not long ago, I heard a, a young girl that has been learning with us for a long time. We, she come, she went to Hong Kong for her PhD, but not long ago we heard that she committed suicide. She was a student of mine in uh, in the school in the university as a master student. So when we were crying for this news, a friend told me, a younger friend told me that among all the coins, among all the people that we know, all these like all very brilliant young people, they choose to they choose they choose a road with no return. They decided to take away their own life. These kind of cases are not rare. 
So this is something that we have to, we have, that's, that, that's exactly what they, why we have to talk about love. We have to talk about hope. We have to use love to love up the people that is around us. That is why all of this is necessary. Otherwise, such kind of uh, such kind of um, dissipate, despair kind of become a norm that is around us. So it is not something irre irre irrealistic, but something necessary. If not in our life, if they, if in our life we don't have any more hope or love or friendship, then we can only face this hopeless world, which is getting more and more dark, which is getting darker and darker. And we have to, we have to see the 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 the, the young generations dying because, and we will have to suffer from it because we have responsibility because we didn't show them our love. We didn't reach out for them. This is uh, my reply based on my own personal experience. And the other point is when we are talking about education, the reason why we're talking about education is because today we see this world is kind of owned by are possessed by some minor, minority group. I repeated this uh, this uh, story, an anecdote, quite many times with the anger that there's some Google Google leader saying that all oh, this uh, technological revolution is going to leave eighty percent of population as unnecessary. So some people ask them that how are we going to deal with this eighty percent of population? He says, his reply is, try to be that 20%. So today's education is, 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 is like uh, to, to encourage us to become that 20%, to encourage this kind of competence, competence that if you, okay, if you are really become part of the 20%, well, I offer my congratulations, but the higher chance is most of us will end up we will, we will end and end, end being that 98 percent we are destined to become the majority the majority losers so-called losers that's why we have to discuss about the different kind of education the different kind of set of values so that this 98 percent of populations can have some hope so I don't, I, I'm not going to pretend that today I could be that 2%, but I'm already old. So very soon I'm going to be that 28% without any doubt. And also more and more young people, they, are, they don't stand any chance to be part of that 2%. That's why we have to discuss, discuss about different values, different, different ways of life and also to ask ourselves what make us happy. Otherwise, otherwise we will have to um, deal with the more very common Chinese topic nowadays, which is to become uh, the so-called inner inner com competence and to lead to the some kind of uh, lack of efficiency and also just to lie down and accept the reality. That is two quite popular words nowadays, but that is not what we want. We don't want to just lie down and think life has no meaning. So more we have discussed about love. But the thing is, we quite often in our daily life, we don't see that big eye or the we. What we see is only the small eye, the little lowercase eye, which is very sharp, very humble. So I'm going to end my my reply is uh, ending with the with the phrase with the phrase of uh, Gustavo that I like a lot, which is every time when I say I is a we. So we want to create a we, not an I. Only in that case could we have a chance of hope. And also uh, earlier in that question, I also heard quite often 
uh, this phrase that she that 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 the 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 student said that is quite impossible. Well, when we declare something that is out of our reach, it is impossible. Then it will definitely become impossible. Only when we keep imagining about it, when we're trying to realize it, the so-called impossibilities, then we can open some chance of possibilities. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dai. Uh, I see that David Barkin is here. Actually, I was uh, about to hand over uh, 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 to David for some time, but um, but then maybe uh, after we hear from David, uh, uh, we, we still have two questions from the audience in China. So I will raise them la a bit later. Um, I think that uh, I, what I would like to emphasize about the issue of hope and uh, the nature of education is the extraordinary importance of cooperation among people. It is not an individual process, it's a collective process. And that the hope and our possibilities of being able to advance and our possibilities of being able to uh, overcome the limitations of the societies that are trying to impose different kinds of institutions is based upon the collective ability to attend to satisfying our basic needs, to make to improving the quality of our life. And that involves many of the issues that have been brought up by Gustavo today and by some of the questions. I think that we have to understand that science, technology, production, and satisfaction of needs can all be achieved together in a cooperative manner. One of the things that we're learning uh, and that the Zapatista movement, I will, uh, moving into the inauguration of the book, the presentation of the book, the Zapatistas themselves are integrating into their ability to improve the quality of their life, to satisfy and, and improve their environment. They are bringing to bear some of the greatest achievements in science and technology, but a but brought in in the context of their own uh, environmental, social, and spiritual development. I won't take more time because we're running way over time. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, well, uh, uh, maybe we we'll, we'll just uh, very quickly uh, say uh, uh, well say the two questions from the audience in China, and uh, maybe uh, Gustavo can give a very brief answer. Uh, one question is, um, uh, the, this, per, this uh, uh, a friend from China, he says that it seems that the friendship that you talk about uh, uh, is very close to the question of uh, what we call benevolence and love in Confucianism. But then today, most people are so uh, selfish, uh, so uh, uh, oriented only to money, uh, to consumption, uh, uh, to consumerism. And so when, when the capitalist uh, forces are so strong, how, uh, what would be the soil for the um, radical change in uh, the uh, attitudes uh, for love and for uh, uh, friendship. And a second question is, um, how can we uh, as a common person without resources uh, learn through, uh, uh, learn uh, by ourselves and uh, can, uh, well, uh, be uh, uh, not reliant on the society so that we can uh, well, uh, uh, gather some strength for ourselves. 
So, uh, so maybe uh, Gustavo, you could briefly answer to these two questions and then we could move on to the book launch. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, let me say the first question is of course uh, clear, uh, but uh, again one source of hope is that uh, we are discovering that people have enough of selfishness and individualism. Perhaps the United States is the country where you have uh, the highest level of individualism, selfishness. And after many, many years, the people have enough and they are trying desperately to abandon their conditions. Unfortunately, many of them are trying to escape from that individualism, selfishness through drugs. And half of the Americans are now on drugs, but also are experimenting Buddhism and many other ways to escape from individualism. Apparently, we came at the point in Yes, capitalist, capitalists are still trying to produce selfishness, but people are discovering that that's the worst possible way to live, to survive in this world, in this horror created by capitalism itself. And this is the moment in which people can really try to escape from selfishness, from individualism, to a possibility of cooperation, as David mentioned, for a real, uh, not only radical change, just to survive in these current conditions of the world for the 80%, for the majority of people on earth, the only way to survive today is to be close with others, to find cooperation with friends in the local place. In the That is how common people can learn, learn from each other more than any other things. Yes, perhaps they can still need to send the children to the school to get a diploma, but it is to discover how in the real setting, in their places, in their soils, in the poorest setting of the world, they can learn for each other and create something different. In fact, I, I dare to say this is sound terrible, but the only way to survive for many people on earth today it is this possibility of they themselves creating that option. I think that they, this is exactly what they are trying to do. This is the source of hope that they are trying to do, that is what is the only way to escape from the current horror. So before we have the book launch, actually, I would also like to put in a few words. And um, I think uh, if th there are two examples I'd like to quote, one is Gustavo himself. Uh, Gustavo belonged to the 1% uh, or less than 1% in Mexico. When he was studying, he was the, well, the best student getting the best marks. And as soon as he graduated, he was already being recruited into the big corporations and um, uh, well, uh, and later on uh, into the government. And uh, when he was in his 20s, he was, all, he was already recruited to be in the government. So he was actually uh, uh, had this opportunity to be in the heart of power, of money, of wealth, of prestige, and so to be above the, to be within the 1% of society. But then if we look at um, what uh, personal trajectory Gustavo has gone through, then we can also then uh, see how a person could be, um, could have this empathy and this um, uh, 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 faith in the majority of the people to take care of themselves, to manage uh, the lives for themselves. And I think that was, um, that is also what um, Gustavo today uh, well, uh, referred to, uh, what uh, Ivan Illich and Paolo Freire, the two great educationists, uh, what they had been doing. And I think Gustavo has also been doing the same. And uh, so I would recommend uh, you to, I mean, the, our, especially uh, the, our young audience uh, today with us um, to read the stories uh, of uh, Gustavo and see how the change had been able to come about that uh, one would uh, be uh, voluntarily giving up certain wealth and prestige and social status to, to, to opt 
to do something that he would believe in that would be for the good of the majority of the people and for the good of humanity. The second example I'd like to uh, quote is the Zapatistas. So today, actually, we haven't talked men a lot about the the what the Zapatistas have been doing because um, uh, we have. Uh, we have seen Gustavo and our friends David and many friends write a lot of things about the Zapatistas and with that we will come to in the book launch in a few minutes. But then if we look at the Zapatistas in 1994 when they shouted the, when they came out with the slogan Buster uh, and then at, and I think at the point when they were going into the insurgents, they didn't expect that they could survive. I think many of them came and so somebody, some people said it was a kind of collective suicide that you would come out with your with the wooden sticks and all this to fight this powerful enemy uh, 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 to fight this powerful um, government which has the support of the uh, United States <laughs> and, and, uh, and but then uh, we saw that um, they, they managed uh, they managed not only because of their own efforts and their own persistence, but also because of the support that the civil society, and, uh, people like uh, Gustavo, like David, uh, like many of our the friends that we see, have been uh, giving. And so it is, uh, and, and uh, since 1994, it has been 27 years. And for these 27 years, it's not just one or two individuals, it's a whole community working on their, in their own ways for the, um, for the uh, building the caracols, for building their autonomy. And what is very important is that they refused to take any funding, uh, any subsidies from the government. And uh, they also, uh, I know also when I went there and talked to the Zapatistas, that there was this big, big debate with, within the communities of whether they should send the children to school, to the normal school, so that they could go to the normal universities and become a very abnormal person. Uh, whereas uh, then there would, there's this other alternative when they have their own schools and they have pre well, nurture their own teachers and doctors so that they that they say we do not uh, now have to wait for the doctors and teachers to come we ourselves are the teachers and the doctors and they when, even if we now look at the situation of COVID-19 we see that the, the community the Zapatista communities have been dealing very well uh, uh, with this um, with this uh, uh, pandemic and so there is such a lot that we can be learning and this is a, a, well an experience that has extended for over 25 years but then if we also look further the whole mobilization and organization of the communities had taken place already long uh, long ago in the 60s in the 70s with the liberation theologies with a lot of the um, different um, people uh, committing them to themselves to this. And this will be one of our topics uh, on uh, June the 29th, when we would go back to see the 60s and 70s and what happened there, how the community bonds and friendships were being fostered so that we can see such an alternative practice, uh, uh, path taken by massive numbers of people in a collective way. And of course, on this uh, on the thirtieth, we will have this dialogue uh, to talk about the experience uh, of the Zapatistas. So I'm not going to that, but I feel that um, even if uh, these two uh, examples that I cite, that of Gustavo's own tra personal trajectory and of the collective trajectory of the Zapatistas, then they tell a lot. And so I think. Um, the uh, questions that have been posed uh, by our friends here uh, are very um, uh, real because uh, we have to worry about the children's future, about the careers, whether they can find a living, they can find a job. And so these are the, 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 the kind of uh, real so-called reality. But then the problem is the so-called reality sometimes make it impossible for us to see that 
uh, this so-called reality is actually very shaky and also there are a lot of problems with it. 